David Fincher's Fight Club turns 20 years old this year, and honestly, it's a title that I could watch each day, every day, and still be impressed by its intoxicating blend of acid tongue nihilism and black comedy satire. And potentially, one of the biggest reasons why this flick is so enduring is that its plot possesses great twists and turns that culminate in the huge reveal that Tyler Durden is in fact a disassociated personality in the mind of the unnamed narrator, commonly referred to by fans as Jack, who was played by Edward Norton. However, what has made this element even more intriguing is that fans have been speculating that what if there's another massive plot twist not spelled out for you by the film, and what if Tyler isn't the only fabricated character in this film? What if, along with this soap-making sociopath, femme fatale Marla Singer is also a constructed persona? I know, it sounds a little out there, but that's kind of the point. With this in mind, I'm Jules, and this is That Film Theory's Why Tyler Durden Isn't the Only Character Who Doesn't Exist. So let's start out in an effort to make this thought credible by attacking the credibility of another, that of Jack, our narrator. We know that from the very introduction of Tyler that our narrator, our insight into the film's universe, as it were, is unreliable. Hell, he even tells us as much. So we should trust that he's, well, not to be trusted. The primary theme of Fincher's film is of disassociation, both in terms of its protagonist's mental state and also how he relates to, or to be more specific, doesn't relate to, society. And these motives are furthered through the characters of Tyler and Marla, as both stand as separate from the collective, as defiant to its rules and regulations, and as examples of the furthest extremes of toxic masculinity. Yet how can we prove that Marla doesn't exist? Well, there's actually quite a few examples that actually did the job for us. Let's start out simple. She shows up to a lung cancer support group while smoking cigarettes. and Nobody says a thing about it to her. I mean, that's pretty weird, right? That no one would address this rather callous moment? Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg, as when we look at how she interacts with Jack, we begin to see that they start finishing each other's sentences very shortly after they've met. And there's even a line when they're divvying up which meetings that they can attend, which states, you can't have the whole brain, implying that Marla and Jack are now fighting for the same space in a single psyche. This shared connection continues later when she attempts to kill herself, and she refers to herself as infectious human waste which is exactly the same words printed on the liposuction bags that Tyler and Jack steal. Other evidence that she's not actually there include when she walks into traffic and cars don't even attempt to move around her, and the fact that in the laundrette she's stealing men's clothes from the dryer, clothes that in fact could well be Jack's own, a perfect metaphor for her removing his stuff from their shared space. Then we have the really strange dildo connection, and by that I mean that at the beginning of the film we see that Jack has his suitcase detained because of a buzzing emanating from it. The security guard refusing to accept that it's not a dildo is amusing to the audience at first, but when we see the large dildo in Marla's room post-suicide attempt, things take on a different meaning. It's not a threat to you, is what Marla tells Jack. The male member is not a threat to you, potentially referring to Tyler, but more probably to the ideas of masculinity that this film is constantly asking us to challenge. In the first instance, we're laughing at a man having a comical misunderstanding about a sex toy, but in the latter, we're seeing it as Jack's fractured psyche manifesting this embarrassment as something more immediate, something which, in his worried mind, is much more of a threat to his male identity. Therefore, while Marla's words might at first seem chiding, they're actually supporting. What she's saying is, it doesn't matter about your dick, Jack. It's not important to who you are. Finally, we have to look at the mention of lie. Now, Marla notes how the Project Mayhem members have been burning their fingertips with lie. But how would she know this? Lie is a pretty unremarkable powdered substance, and she wasn't present when this was explained, so unless Jack told Marla, which, true, it's still a possibility, how else would she have known? And it's here that you might be thinking, well, this is all well and good, Jules, but it's completely undone by the fact that we see a waiter take her order in the film. Well, the counter to this point is, at this stage in time, Project Mayhem members would be completely aware of their leader's strange habits. And once again, are we even to trust what we see just because it's being told from Jack's point of view? 
So if we continue this line of thought and say that Marla is indeed a figment of Jack's imagination, then why? Well, it might be to balance out the invasive and ultimately destructive force of Tyler. Within Jack's mind, we see Marla take the place of his spirit animal, a clear sign of want from his body for help to combat the new and destructive forces that are now entering his life. Tyler represents a new masculine ideal, rejecting the status quo of the Calvin Klein male and building up a new kind of aspirational figure albeit one that's fundamentally angry and destructive. Conversely, Marla is a manifestation of guilt, anguish and regret, as well as all the basic human desires for intimacy, which at the beginning of the movie, Jack has effectively been stealing from the terminally ill. Both are impulsive, both are self-destructive, but in different ways. One is aiming at control and the other looking at chaos. And then we notice that the pair never truly exist in the same film space. Tyler and Marla interact in the sense that they have sex, but they don't ever speak, something that Jack compares to the relationship between his mother and father. Even the sex scene between the pair is a CGI fever dream where the two bodies are almost fused together in a fantastical state. It's not real, because they are not real. And if any action is taking place right now at that point in time in the film, it's Jack masturbating. I am Jack's grunting onanism. Moving now to the infractions of logic that exist between Tyler and Marla. For example, the speed which Tyler gets to Marla's apartment to prevent her suicide could imply that he never really left, being the same person and all he wouldn't need to. Plus, Tyler saving Marla to save himself would also tie up the nagging question raised by Jack. How could Tyler, of all people, think it was a bad thing that Marla Singer was about to die? It doesn't really vibe with his nihilistic mindset unless he's doing it out of self-preservation. Tyler is Jack. Marla is Jack. Therefore, to save Tyler, Tyler must save Marla. It's not the only time that these characters are used to show a sliding scale of balance within Jack's mind, as when Jack chews out his boss and gives in to some of Tyler's tendencies, namely the aggression and acid tongue, we see that Marla develops a fear of breast cancer. It's an action that weakens her position in Jack's mind as he gives in to Tyler. Even her physical appearance begins to change. She begins the movie looking relatively well-groomed and appealing, but as Tyler moves more and more into the picture in the second half of the movie, she looks ever more tawdry and hopeless, while Tyler, on the other hand, reigns supreme. Jack and Marla even discuss this dynamic in the kitchen of the Paper Street house, where Marla mentions how both she and Jack are weak people, attaching themselves to a stronger entity. And ultimately, that becomes a not very strongly coded message about these three jostling personalities. And so we come to the closing argument, which fittingly comes at the end of the film itself. Now, the final shot sees Jack and Marla looking out into the city as Project Mayhem's plan is flawlessly executed, with the credit card buildings all detonating and collapsing around them. It's such a stirring image that it's easy for fans to miss a theory-supporting visual clue hidden in plain sight. Jack and Marla look almost identical. As they hold hands, a trouserless Jack wears a jacket that, in the scene's low lighting, looks almost exactly like the skirt-fur-coat combo that Marla is wearing. The only major tell of who is who is their different hairstyles. But it's a telling image. With Tyler dead, Marla appears to have won. And the symbolism of the two wearing the same clothes while holding hands seems to point to their three-way conflict now resolved as a two-way partnership. She might not be real in the literal sense, but she is definitely real enough to affect Jack in whatever life is left after the movie's close. And there we go, those are some thoughts on Fight Club and whether Marla is indeed a figment of Jack's personality. I hope that you enjoyed this, and if you've got any other sort of points to add to or detract from this theory, please state them below because this is a discourse and I do enjoy reading your thoughts as much as I do spewing my own to you. But before I go, David Fincher's Fight Club is a film that deals with the exploration of different fractured mental psyches. And it is something that can affect a lot of people in very, very different and trust me not so entertaining ways so if you have problems with this sort of stuff if you feel like you are alone i just want to state to you right now my friend you are never 
ever alone. If you're struggling with thoughts like this, of the self-destructive tendencies that can affect each and every one of us, then please speak to someone. Trust me, people care way more than you might realize. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. You can follow me at RetroJ with a zero if you'd like to, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.